Something that I've done in the past is also categorizing my own personal tools, you know, including like, okay, these are kind of my own ground rules for my own behavior. These are the tools that I know tend to work for me. And then these are like the break glass in case of emergency. I'm like really freaking out. And these are the things that I can turn to. Again, having this written down and accessible ahead of time so that when emotions are high and cognition is low, you have something else to turn to. You're not relying just on your own power to whip out something and make a decision about what you're going to do and what's going to help you. Welcome to the Multi Amory Podcast. I'm Jace. I'm Emily. And I'm Dedeker. We believe in looking to the future of relationships, not maintaining the status quo of the past. So whether you're monogamous, polyamorous, swinging, casually dating, or if you just do relationships differently, we see you and we're here for you. On this episode of the Multi Amory Podcast, we're talking about 50 ways to handle jealousy. Well, actually, this is the first of a two parter episode. So today we're talking about the first 26 ways to handle jealousy. And then next week we'll do the remaining 24. This is the question that pretty much every polyamorous or non monogamous person gets asked How do you deal with the jealousy? And this is not even unique to non-monogamy or polyamory at all. Jealousy can come up in monogamous relationships, even in friendships or any number of different relationships. But we do always tend to get the question if we're non-monogamous. And to have a functioning non-monogamous relationship often means we need to redefine our relationship to jealousy, and that relationship can change over time, but there are still times when it comes up. And remember that you can feel compersion or happiness for your partner having other relationships, and you can also feel envy or jealousy at the same time. Those things aren't mutually exclusive, and if you feel those, you're not failing. There's nothing wrong with you, but it is important to have tools at your disposal for how to handle that. So in these two episodes, we're going to be going through all of these different techniques for emotional regulation, for handling your jealousy, so that if you're ever in need, you can come back to these two episodes and just listen through it and see which ones sound interesting to try. Maybe there's a new one you want to try. Maybe there's a reminder of one that's worked for you in the past. And hopefully this can be a really great resource for you to come back to anytime you need it. So when I wrote this episode and specifically the title of this episode, I was very intentional with my choice of words of calling it 50 ways to handle jealousy. So not cope with jealousy, not manage your jealousy, not tame your jealousy, not deal with your jealousy. I suppose that in my mind, I wanted it to be a little bit more positive, like animal handling. You know, we handle Mm. the animal. Mm. We're gentle and we're compassionate, but we're also in control at the same time. We do have proficiency in animal handling, so that's great. Yeah, right? Put a lot of points into that. So that's the image that I wanted here for all of these things is that this isn't about trying to crush it or trying to cram it into a little box Mm. or trying to find the pill that I'm going to take that's going to eliminate and cure all my jealousy. It's about handling it. I think it's interesting that you say the word control as well, because when you're in really heightened emotional moments, that control sometimes feels like the first thing to go out the window your cognition is low, your ability to put yourself back into one piece is low. And I think that's why episodes like this are so important, because it can be difficult to know like which tool to grab. And if you have potentially 50 at your disposal, not that you're going to take every single tool that we give you, but the ones that really resonate with you, I think it's important to be able to go and say, okay, I'm going to try this, see how it works, because I want to be able to get back to a place of not feeling such intense emotion that causes me to potentially react in a negative way or feel really awful for a longer period of time. It can bring us back to that moment of peace and control and being able to feel good again in the moment. So We divided this big list of 50 into four different sections, 
And we're going to do two of those sections this episode and then two sections next episode. So all of the sections I'll preview right now. First, we're going to do tools for your brain. Second, we're going to do tools for your body. Third, tools for your relationships. And fourth, tools for your heart and soul. Going a little bit more internal or kind of deeper woo-woo soul (laughs) feeling in those moments. But those two last ones are going to be in the next episode. Yeah, so the disclaimer is that this is the most useful if you're in a situation where you know that things are above board. What I mean by that is, you know, I'm happily consenting to being in a non-monogamous relationship. You know, my partner and I have communicated about their plans going on a date or like what's going on in their other relationships, but I'm still feeling jealousy, right? So I want to distinguish that from other situations where I think that feeling intense envy or intense jealousy can be 100% legitimate. It can be 100% an alarm bell going off that's telling you, oh my God, someone is not treating me well. I'm not getting what I need in this relationship. Um, This attachment is slipping away from me. Someone is lying to me. Someone's neglecting me. Someone's intentionally excluding me. That All of those are legitimate situations where it's understandable and correct to be upset and to feel jealousy. So if that's what's going on for you, or if there are fundamental issues with relationship security, there isn't a single tool that can fix just that. And we do have an entire other podcast and backlog talking about all those other relationship and attachment supporting tools. So that's not necessarily what we're talking about today. Other times, it's just about detoxing from old scripts. This is something that's come up a lot with my clients, people who come to me and are like, I wanted this in the first place. I wanted the Mm. non-monogamous relationship. I encouraged my partner to go on the date. And then now that they're on the date, I'm freaking out. And I don't know why, like my partner hasn't done anything wrong. I'm just having all these reactions and these feelings coming up. So Again, like Jace was saying, this list could just be 50 ways to regulate your emotions. Doesn't have to just be about jealousy. It can be about whatever intense emotions are coming up for you in a particular moment. So without further ado, let's get into talking about tools for your brain. So these are specific tools for if you're someone where your feelings of jealousy tend to be very cognitive. So they can manifest as repetitive thoughts, intrusive thoughts, thought spiraling, you know, inability to focus on anything else. So if that's you, you might consider trying some of these things. So tool number one, I highly recommend writing out your toolkit ahead of time. So what that looks like is when you're not in a moment of intense feelings or intense jealousy, taking the time to sit down and write out what are the things that do tend to help me when I'm feeling intense emotions, right? Uh, Or you could just like save this podcast episode or consult the transcript, right? Something that I've done in the past is also categorizing my own personal tools, you know, including like, okay, these are kind of my own ground rules for my own behavior. These are the tools that I know tend to work for me. And then these are like the break glass in case of emergency. I'm like really freaking out. And these are the things that I can turn to. Again, having this written down and accessible ahead of time so that when emotions are high and cognition is low, you have something else to turn to. You're not relying just on your own power to whip out something and make a decision about what you're going to do and what's going to help you. Yeah. Being proactive instead of reactive is always so helpful. Number two is to do a journal dump. And y'all know that I like to talk about journaling a lot. Uh, Because for me, when I get caught up in those thoughts, they're just, you know, going around and around and around in my mind. And sometimes, sometimes I'm not even totally aware of what they are, because they're just kind of cycling in the background. And so doing, you know, just doing journaling where you're just writing down whatever's in your head, there's not really a structure or a goal to it. It's more stream of consciousness, or train of thought. It could be writing as if you're explaining it to someone else. It could just be notes for yourself. Whatever it is, just the point is that you're putting it down on paper. And I find it's best 
to write it by hand. Although if for you typing or something like that works better, that's certainly helpful too. Number three is mind mapping. This is something I believe we've talked about in previous episodes, and it's kind of similar to journaling. So mind mapping can kind of help you to map out in an artistic fashion, like linearly what is going on in your brain. And it doesn't even need to be linear. It can just be whatever the heck is going on. You know, draw something that feels angry, draw something that exposes, you know, what happened to you in the past that may be leading you in a certain direction with what's happening at this particular moment in time. It can be whatever. Now, there's also, because mind mapping is something that's used in like project planning or life organization, there's also a lot of apps out there for doing this, where you basically have all the different bubbles that you put text in and connect them with lines. That's essentially what the mind map is in that way. There's also a fun VR one I played with, where you actually, with your, with your like VR goggles on, can like place items and then you speak and it does the microphone to transcribe and then you can link them up and kind of walk around through your mind map. That's maybe a bit overboard, but hey, it might help distract you from what you're worried about if you're trying to build your (laughs) VR mind map. Wow. Wow. So tool number four is called just the facts, ma'am, sir, ma'am, sir, non-gender specific person, title (laughs) person. (laughs) So, and this is, this can be a journaling prompt as well. And it's writing out what the situation is with zero value judgments, writing it out the way a reporter or a scientist might. So this exercise helps to discourage you from any catastrophizing that you may want to put into the situation, any coloring with your own emotions, the sense of like, oh, they're totally, you know, they're going to leave me or I'm horrible and unlovable. Like it's literally just writing out what is happening. And that may not like fix all of your emotions about it, but it can help to create a little bit of distance and maybe even make the situation seem a little bit less big and overwhelming. This is something my therapist does a lot with me. It just it, because our, our emotions color our perception so much and we may be feeling really down on ourselves and then therefore we spit out a thing that we think is a fact and it in fact isn't. It's just our perception of maybe the situation that occurred. And I love the idea of really getting very granular and writing down facts about something and seeing, oh, okay, actually, did they ever say this thing about me? Have they ever you know, noted that they dislike this thing about me in the past or whatever or You know, if it's a jealousy situation, did they ever say that this person was better at this thing than I am? Not Mm. necessarily. So, yeah, that that kind of helps to alleviate all of those stresses, potentially. Yeah, yeah, I do like that. I definitely had a a therapist who would do that a lot to me Mm. when I would be worried about performances. Like if I played a show or something, I'd be like, I think everyone disliked it. And she'd say, huh did they tell you that? Like, how do you know that? And kind of would point out, like, I don't actually have evidence for it. I was just worried, but yeah, it Mm -hmm. was, was definitely helpful. Uh, number five on our list here is called the unique list. And so this is to write down all of the things that are great, special, and unique about you without qualifying them. So without saying, I mean, it could be better, but but like, but you know, I, I think I'm okay at this or, you know, maybe I'm not as good as so-and-so, but like, but maybe I'm good at this. Not as good as I used to be five years ago. Right, right. Any number of things. And so what's interesting about this exercise is one, it can be surprisingly challenging to do, uh, but take comfort in the fact that you're making this list not to show to anybody, right? You're not creating your dating profile or your resume and putting these on there. Although maybe it's good practice for things you could put on those later. Uh, But you know, it's just this list for yourself and to kind of be aware of if you're writing something and you feel like a little bit weirdly uncomfortable while you're writing it, that might be an indication there's something there and there actually might be a lot of truth to it. And that's kind of why you get that feeling of like, I feel weird to even say this could actually be because it's so true. We talked about this a little bit in 
episode 388, the comparison episode, there was a worksheet that my therapist gave me on the strengths exploration. I think Mm, that would be if you're having a difficult time coming up like in your head with things that you think that you're good at, that gives you a huge list of things that you, you know, qualities or whatever that you are good at. And you can look on that and then, you know, celebrate all of the things that you're great at. (laughs) I'm saying that uh, for myself too, because it's difficult for me and it's difficult for all of us in a lot of ways, but it's, it's good. It's a good reminder for sure. Number six is what's the opposite of this thought? So for this, you can identify a few primary thoughts that are swirling around in your brain and you can write out what the exact opposite of the thought might be and you can see what that brings up for you. I like this one just because sometimes (laughs) sometimes it's great to realize, hey, what I'm thinking is probably not a fact and it's probably not true and there are things out there you know, the exact opposite may actually be closer to what reality is in this moment. And it's just a good reminder that your intrusive thoughts are not necessarily what's actually going on and that you can move past them. Yeah, I think the last time I did this, it was around something about, you know, the thought that's rolling around is, oh my gosh, like I, I'm never going to get as much like time with my partner as I want, and someone else is always going to get more time with them. And then the opposite thought being like, I have plenty of time with my partner. And they also share that time with other Mm. people. So it's also kind of more of a neutral thought as well. And again, in that moment, it's it's not like it's going to fix everything. But I think it could help just give a little bit of perspective. And for number seven, we have the emotion wheel. So back in episode 348, we talked about the Plutchik emotion wheel. Uh, You can also just Google that and you'll find it. Um, But use an emotion wheel or some other tool like just lists of different emotion words to pick from to help you to pinpoint precisely what's coming up for you. And then also ideally to keep track of that. Maybe you notice, okay, these are the emotions or if it's an emotion wheel, you could kind of see, okay, I'm very much on this side of the wheel, right? Like there's a lot of words over here, maybe even color code them or something. And then the next time you're experiencing this, you could come back and say, huh, look, I'm, I'm still in this same part of the wheel over here. Or maybe it's, you know what? I'm actually feeling pretty different stuff. I'm calling it jealousy still, but it's actually pretty different feeling. There's just ways to get information for yourself that can help you with determining, you know, what can I do about this, but also just can help you get to know yourself a little bit better, which in itself is a way of helping to regulate those emotions. Number eight, I love this one, is a therapist dump. So if you already have an established relationship with a therapist and you feel like they're supportive of you, you can reach out to them and you know, you can talk to them about whatever it is that's going on. I think it's always a good idea to use the Triforce of Communication in moments like this, because you may specifically be wanting something from them like advice or just coddling and appreciation and love and understanding and acceptance. And so potentially differentiate between the things that you want and let them know, hey, I need to talk about this to someone. I'm not looking for specific advice. I really just want to dump on you and I pay you to do that. So I'm going to. (laughs) Thanks. Uh Tool number nine is chair work. I learned about this from Martha Cowpey's book, actually. And I absolutely love this tool. I've used it myself many times since I first learned about it. And the whole purpose of chair work is to create a dialogue between conflicting parts of yourself. So let's say you've identified, you know, there's one part of me that's totally freaked out and panicking. But then there's also another part of me that wants to be supportive and wants to be chill. And like, how do I deal with feeling both those things at once? You can have those two parts of you get in dialogue together, have a conversation. And this can literally look like I'm going to set out two chairs. And when I sit in this chair, I'm playing the part of my freaked out self talking to the supportive self. And then when I get in this chair, I'm the supportive self 
responding to that and making my own arguments. Or if you don't want to act out a little melodrama for yourself, this could also be a journaling exercise as well. And what this does, again, is it helps to separate these things out. And I think there could be a lot of insight in how these two parts of you talk to each other. You can recognize like, oh, yeah, actually, this freaked out side of me maybe makes a good point over here. Or, oh, the supportive side also is making a good point, you know, and I think it can help with processing and helping you to get, you know, really, you're kind of getting those two conflicting parts of you at least a little bit more in sync. I've been told to make like a pros and cons list also in certain situations. And that's Mm -hmm. helpful too. Yeah. So actually number 10 is a good tool for doing some of that. Uh, And these are using CBT worksheets. So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And if you just look up CBT worksheets online, you'll find there's a ton of them out there that are available to download for free, um, you know, as PDFs or just images that you can look at. And they cover all sorts of different things. Like I'm just looking at a few that come up in my search right now, but there's one called Fact or Opinion. That's Mm -hmm. just about determining, is this thing a fact or an opinion? So going back to what we talked about before of trying to write about this subjectively, or just things about exploring your worries, which is something that comes up a lot with jealousy as it comes from a fear or a worry. And so just this is a great way of, you know, having some prompts and some guides for how to work through figuring out what am I feeling, asking yourself some useful questions, uh, you know, that have been put together specifically based on research and looking at, you know, what are effective ways of breaking down these emotions and thinking about them. If you're someone who likes to think about them in that kind of cognitive intellectual sort of way, CBT worksheets are an awesome way to do that. And related to that, there's a lot of wonderful workbooks out there. So specifically, Kathy Labriola has a jealousy workbook. Kitty Chambliss has a jealousy workbook. If you go and just Google like polyamory jealousy workbook, those will probably be your first two hits. I think there's a couple others. Again, if you're someone who does really well with structured exercises and really likes leaning into that cognitive side of things, it's a great place to start. Both of these workbooks have a ton of different exercises, um, you know, and you can write in them. It's just like your school days. Um, I would highly recommend. Number 12 is to distract and or reward the inner toddler. Love this one. Maybe <laughs> let yourself indulge with inappropriate limits for yourself, but that might include getting a glass of wine, even having a cigarette. I wouldn't do that, but but maybe well, the two that's of you. Not what your inner toddler wants. Right. Emily, My inner some toddler inner toddler. I, I, I shouldn't wants judge. A smoke sometimes. Judge. <laughs> but wine, absolutely, <laughs> or another alcoholic <laughs> beverage of choice. A comfort movie, a comfort TV show, comfort food, even a new video game. I might also like, I don't know, like buy something. <laughs> That's something I would do. Sure, yeah. <laughs> See, exactly. Yeah. It's something along Again, those lines. Yeah. Within yes. limits, right? You are the one who's going to know if this is a maladaptive mm-hmm. behavior for you. Mm-hmm. But also sometimes it's like you just kind of like spoil yourself Tense. a little bit in whatever way you can. If that's going to help switch off your brain and give you that little squirt of dopamine or serotonin, yeah. I'm like all for it. And, and to be honest, it, even if, say, there's one of these things you're trying to stop doing, like you're trying to stop smoking in those moments where you're feeling all this jealousy and panic come up, absolutely, that's when you're going to want it. Mm. But maybe rather than kind of beating yourself up over that or just trying to white knuckle it, it's like, let me treat myself to something else. Let me find some other way mm-hmm. I can give myself a reward and give more of a positive, here's here's something instead, yeah. right? And then number 13, this is a favorite of mine. And this is... Yeah, I knew this was going to be be a a big old tool for Jays. Yeah. And this is to pick a new skill to learn. Uh, And so in general, for me, I just love learning stuff. But I think there's something special in this case about learning a skill. Uh, and this could take a lot of different forms, but learning a skill, it's not just like I'm I'm getting knowledge, but I'm also getting something that I can apply, right? And so this could be something like 
you know, knitting or crocheting or, you know, model making or some kind of hands-on type craft, but it could also be a skill of like, I want to learn how to make 3d graphics. I'm going to download blender, which is free and watch some online tutorials and learn how to make 3d models on my computer. Or I'm going to, again, with blender, (laughs) learn how to make models that I can 3d print if I have a local makerspace or that I can order through a service like Shapeways online, right? Mm-hmm. But just something that excites you and that interests you. And the whole point of it is that it's not just learning, but you're also trying to apply it right away. So it's going to occupy more of your brain. Like you're going to be more focused on, okay, I really need to learn this to the point I can do it. Not just to say, oh yeah, I listened to the History of English podcast and now I know a lot of history. <laughs> Well, related to that, pick up a crafting project or an art project in particular, like basically a constructive activity that helps you get in the zone that will take up your focus, right? But ideally also that's maybe calming or soothing for you, you know? Um, yeah, so so that can be either, again, something that you learn brand new or something that you've been doing for a long time, you know, but again, like finding something that helps you use your hands perhaps, or just kind of engage in a slightly different way. Next one is one that I definitely could do more often. And that is to put your phone away or step away from social media and especially the news. The news can be really, really challenging, especially in certain moments of, intensity and around the election times, for example, or if something really awful is happening in the news, it just can be really overwhelming at times. And it's good to take a moment and step away from that. So, you know, unless you know which type of content legitimately comforts you, such as animal videos, or for me, figure skating, that comforts me, (laughs) or makeup TikTok, something along those lines. But otherwise, it's really good to kind of take a break from social media and from the news from time to time, for sure. Yeah. So, so even if you are going to go to TikTok or YouTube or something to not just go to your feed, right? Cause that's going to be that mix. And, you know, part of the reason why news is not very healthy for us, especially when we're already in an upset emotional state is because that's what gets you to pay attention to stuff. That's what's getting you to pay attention to your jealous thoughts right now to these thoughts of threat is because our we're, you know, as humans, we're attuned to focus on threats so that we can avoid them. And the news plays on that. So it's just going to really drum up more of that type of feeling even if it seems like, oh, well, that's different than what I'm jealous about. It's stirring up similar feelings of fear and worry and and stress. And so it's just really not going to be good. So if you're going to YouTube, for example, go to a specific channel that you know makes the type of videos that you're looking for. Or if it's on TikTok, go to a specific account that you know makes fun lighthearted things rather than just going through your feed because you don't know what's going to come up in there. And some of it might be upsetting and then you kind of set yourself back. Yeah. Number 16, this is the last one in the tools for your brain section. And this is all about sleeping. So I know that if my partner or partners are occupied away on a date, sometimes even if I'm not having a hard time with it, even if I feel okay, like I may still have trouble sleeping. Mm. And I found that this happened for me both when I was living alone and also when I was used to having a partner in bed with me, that it's quite normal, you know, um, that if you're used to someone being there and then they're not there, that that can be disturbing to your sleep, right? Or if you're just like emotionally upset, it can make it really hard to sleep. So for myself, I pretty consistently when I'm sleeping by myself. Now I put on either some kind of sleep sounds. Um, I'm a huge fan of the sleep with me podcast, which is just a guy telling some boring stories (laughs) in a really relaxed and meandery and unintentionally funny kind of way. And I love it. It really does help soothe me enough and gives a little something for my brain to listen to. So I think that's the important thing is instead of just laying in bed, just with my own thoughts and being all upset that I have something that I can listen to. And usually in this case, it's like a weird 
meandery, dreamish kind of story. So there's something there, but it's not so engaging that that's going to prevent me from being able to drift off to sleep. Yeah, it's like that perfect balance between just engaging enough, but not too engaging to keep you awake, right? (laughs) It's like finding the podcast that does that for you. Uh, So before we go on to our tools for your body, which will be our second category for this episode, we're going to take a quick break to talk about some ways you can support this show. If this information is helpful to you, if you enjoy these resources and want to make sure that we're able to continue hosting this podcast and getting it out to more people available to everyone for free on your podcast players, The best thing you can do is to just take a moment to listen to the ads right now. If any of them seem interesting to you, give them a listen. Go check it out by using our promo codes. It does directly help support our show, and we do really appreciate that. I'm going to set a little scene for you all out there. Just imagine in your mind's eye that you've been having kind of a rough day at work and you look down at your phone, you're about ready to go. It's around 5.30 p.m., and all of a sudden you see... This lovely text from Coral via your partner. Coral is our new sponsor. And the text reads something like, oh, you're so sexy. You know what part of your body I love the most? It's your sexy long legs and your your beautiful <laughs> skin. And your partner's saying it in their most provocative voice. And then you get to tell them back, their sexiest part of their body. And you know, when you get home, it's going to be time for a wild night. And that's all thanks to Coral. (laughs) Our sponsor, Coral, is a fun and easy to use app that is based on research about how to make your life with a partner more intimate. You can link your account to a partner or you could do it on your own as well. And there's a few different parts to it. So one, like Emily was talking about, was the connect part of the app, which is this secure encrypted chat space that will also give you prompts of things to send each other or voice messages or little cute things to do for each other, like leave a post-it note with a you know some sort of sexy thing on the bathroom mirror or something like that. There's also guided audio exercises that are for connecting with your partner as well as exploring yourself and discussion forums that are led by some of Coral's experts and advisors so that you can get in there and actually have discussions and ask questions about things that are going on. It's been a lot of fun. I actually uh, have not yet done it today, but I'm supposed to put a post-it note in the bathroom for Dedeker. So I better get on that. I'll be looking forward to that. (laughs) <laughs> Visit mycoral.co slash multi to download Coral and begin creating deeper intimacy with yourself or with a partner today. That's mycoral.co slash multi, M-Y-C-O-R-A-L dot C-O slash M-U-L-T-I and start using Coral today. Mycoral.co slash multi. The link is in the episode's description. And now a word from our sponsor, BetterHelp. On this show, when we look at studies having to do with wellness and mental well-being and stuff like that, we often come across this thing of mindfulness and certain just sort of mindfulness skills being shown to be a really effective way of reducing stress or at least making you more resilient to setbacks and stresses and things like that. And having a professional who's there to help you work through some of those things, maybe giving you some exercises to do or worksheets or just being someone to talk to about things can really help you to stay in that problem solving and solution oriented mode rather than just getting overwhelmed and and buried under all of your own anxieties and stresses. Yeah, so I'm a huge believer in being active in your own healing and recovery. And something that we haven't even gotten to mention about BetterHelp is that in addition to doing one-on-one therapy, either via video or the phone or via chat, they also offer these groupinars, essentially these online seminars covering a wide variety of topics that you can join anytime. Um, and they repeat the same topics pretty frequently so that if you miss one on a particular date and time, you can still jump in. But they have things like looking at their list, uh, specifically a seminar about boundaries and getting better about holding boundaries. 
um, coping skills for stress and depression, uh, one about strategies to cope with racial injustices. So they really cover a wide variety of topics. Um, they're included with your membership. You don't need to pay anything extra. Um, I've taken a couple of these, and I will say that I think that they're fantastic. When you want to be a better problem solver, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash multi today and get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp.com slash multi. I am not somebody that can handle a whole lot of THC. So something like microdosing is a really good way for me to be able to wind down and get in a good headspace, sort of get out of my own way, especially in the evening when maybe obtrusive thoughts are going on or it's hard for me to get to sleep. Microdosing is an awesome way for me to just sort of push all that to the side and get myself in a nice, comfortable, restful place. And our sponsor for this week, Microdose Gummies, helps me do that so well. Yeah, they really do taste and feel amazing. I really also take them mostly to wind down in the evening, but they're also sometimes nice, you know, where Dedeker and I might say, hey, you know, you want to do a little like mini film festival for two and have some of our Lumi gummies just to kind of get in the zone, feel a little bit fuzzy, a little more creative, but it's mild enough that it's not like we're incapacitated or anything, right? It's for that micro dosing just for, for feeling good. Some people even take it to help get in the zone for creative work or things like that. Uh, so there's a lot of different possibilities and there's all different combinations of strains and different flavors that so far, all the ones I've tried have been fantastic. Microdose is available nationwide. To learn more about microdosing THC, go to microdose.com and use code MULTI to get free shipping and 30% off your first order. The link is in the show's description, but again, that's microdose.com and code MULTI. Most of you listening out there have probably heard us singing the praises of Pros, the world's most personalized hair care. And for those of you that haven't, we want to tell you about the incredible results that we're seeing since using our customized Pros products. I got to say my dandruff has really basically gone away since using my Pros products. I have a mask that I use every single time. I wash my hair, which is only a few times a week, but I put that on first, and then after about 10 minutes, I wash it off and use my shampoo and conditioner. And then I have dry shampoo for the days when I am not going to wash my hair, and that makes everything more matte, not as oily, because I'm an oily lady. So all of those (laughs) things are wonderful. Pros is excellent just for me, because I have really fine hair. I also am vegan. I want my products to be vegan. And I got to take a pros quiz where I told them all of my specifications about my hair, where I live, what I want the smell to be like all of those things. So it's really customizable hair care for me. Yeah. By looking at these 85 different factors, they determine a unique blend of ingredients. So it's not just one from a preset, but it's actually a unique blend for your hair and what kind of climate you live in and stuff like that. It's a really, really cool idea. As someone who is a licensed cosmetologist and has worked in hair for a long time, I just think that's such a neat way to take advantage of the technology we have and the ability to custom mix these things. It's just really, really cool. And if you're not 100% positive, Pros is the best hair care you've ever had. They'll take the products back. No questions asked. Pros is the healthy hair care regimen with your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash multi. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash M-U-L-T-I for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Hello, and we're back and we're going to be moving on to tools for your body. So, What I mean by tools for your body is that for some people, their experience of jealousy or intense emotion isn't necessarily in their head at all, or it's only a little bit something they notice in their head or cognitively, but mostly they notice it in their body. There's these physiological symptoms that show up. That can be everything from your stomach feeling upset, a tightness in the chest, feeling like you want to cry, muscle tension, or sometimes shaking, or, uh, you know, feeling blood boiling, like all kinds of physiological symptoms can come up. And part of this is because 
you know, our bodies can sometimes rocket into survival mode, you know, into fight, flight, freeze, fawn, and all of the weird physical symptoms that are associated with each of those responses, right? So these tools are meant to help alleviate some of that in your body and help to alleviate some of the physiological symptoms, or at least find a way to reframe them and understand them a little bit better. So the first tool, tool number 17, is to sift through it. I think we talked about this back on the, uh, what was it, the putting feelings into mm-hmm. words episode, mm, right. if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, where we correctly. talked about the yeah. emotion wheel as well. The emotion wheel, yes. So this tool is a little bit of a bridge between the brain section and the body section. So SIFT, S-I-F-T, stands for sensation, image, feeling, and thought. So the idea is that when you're having a lot of intense physical feelings come up, emotional feelings come up, you just kind of go through this one by one. What are the sensations that I'm having? So let's clue into like what's actually physically happening in my body. Then we check in with what images are arising. So is there like a particular nightmare vision (laughs) popping off in your brain? Is there like a bad memory from the past that's replaying in your brain? feeling, which is about those emotions, right? And you can kind of circle back to maybe using that emotion wheel to get more curious about, you know, what feelings you may be experiencing. Or you can, again, just check in with your body of like, ooh, I think I'm feeling sad. How do I know that it's sadness? What does sadness feel like? Where does it show up in my body? And then the last one is thought, which again, is kind of more of like the cognitive stuff that we were talking about before, but identifying you know, what are the thoughts that I'm having? What's the value judgment that's coming out here? What's the meaning that I'm making? And so, again, this one just kind of bridges a lot of these together. But I appreciate that it starts with sensation of like first going to that, to just that curiosity of what's actually happening in your body, instead of just trying to run away from it. Mm. First thing. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's our instinct, right? It's just I want to numb this instead. Mm. It's like, let's Mm -hmm. let's understand it first. Yeah, Yeah, that's great. Uh, number 18 is movement. So physical movement of some kind. This could be exercise, yoga, dance. It could be structured, like doing a dance class or something or a yoga class, or it could be unstructured of, I'm just going to, you know, punch dance it out in the living room or <laughs> in a park or whatever, or maybe it's going for a run or even a walk. Uh, just let your body do what it's craving. And something to be aware of with this is, you know, if anger or aggression comes up, or sometimes my body feels like it wants to, you know, throw this fan out the window or something, it's, you know, put put some limits on it, obviously, and try to, to regulate that. But find like, okay, is there a way I could do that same gesture, but without the fan in my hand, right? Like, let your, let it out, let yourself express that. Um, I've found for me, there were, there were a few years ago, there was a really rough time where for me, it was going and doing like really intense weightlifting workout that like that, Mm. that was the thing that would get me through it. And I would end up feeling a lot better because it's like, it wasn't violent movements, but it's, you're really exerting yourself. And that helped kind of get out some of that, that energy that I was feeling when I was so upset. I love the way that my therapist has put this, which is, she says that like when we're building a fire out in the woods, like when we're camping, the first thing you do is you build a fire ring, right? Mm. And so it's the difference between I'm building a fire ring and then setting something Mm. on fire versus I'm just going to set things on fire (laughs) indiscriminately, Uh right? So it's like, it's, it's okay to explore that anger or aggression that's coming up in your body, but just find ways to contain it. Yeah. Number 19 is progressive relaxation. This is something that I've done in yoga or meditation. It's essentially tensing and relaxing different muscle groups at a time to encourage relaxation. So you might start, you know, with your forehead or with your shoulders and kind of work your way all throughout your body. You can definitely pay attention to places like your jaw or your neck or your belly me like I hold a ton of tension in my jaw and I I chew a lot at night and so that's something that's a place that's going to be very tense a lot of the time and that I'll have tension in there are a ton of progressive relaxation meditations and videos available online for free so you can check those out sometimes you might be able to find them just auditorily 
as opposed to just in video. So you can check all of those out and try it for yourself. Tool number 20 is orienting. So the whole purpose of this tool is actually to kind of get your brain back online. For some people, it's the opposite, right? Their brain is like too active. Um, But the whole point of this is like, if you're overwhelmed with physiological sensations, it's about getting um, that observer back online, that conscious observer back online. So these can be like the classic tools, like counting things, finding all the blue things in the room. If that works for you, I like to go even simpler of just like, get curious about what's going on in the corners of my room. Hmm. You know, this, this area that I probably don't ever specifically pay attention to, like, I'm going to look at all of the corners of this room and just see what's going on. Or I'm going to see what is going on with my sense of smell. Just like right now in this moment, what can I smell? What can I hear? You know, so again, it's just kind of like trying to get your focus to be not totally subsumed by, oh, these horrible feelings and physiological feelings that are coming up, but just sort of orienting to like what's actually happening in the present moment. And then number 21 is self-touch. Or I would even just say like touch experiences might be another way to say this, because this could be a comforting touch of just like giving yourself a hug or, you know, rubbing your arms or something. It could be taking a bath and just, you know, relaxing and feeling being in the water. It could be getting a massage, but it also could be a pleasant sensory experience like having an orgasm or something like that. Right. So the whole point of it though, is it's about getting in touch with your body in, in an experience that you're controlling and it's an enjoyable experience. It's kind of trying to bring out that ability to have physical pleasure instead of just, you know, feeling locked down or those physical feelings of stress. Along those lines, you can also get comforting touch from others. And that might include things like platonic cuddling or cuddle groups or connecting with another partner. If you're feeling jealous about potentially a partner that is on a date at this potential moment in time, then you can go and talk to another partner or a group of friends or a cuddle group and get some loving touch from them. Yeah. So uh, if you go back and listen to episode 361, that was our interview with John Howard, where I remember he talked about the power of letting someone hold you like a baby you know, so, so it could be, maybe you have another partner that you can go to and just ask them to hold you like a baby for a little while and see what that brings up. Or, you know, maybe you can recruit a friend ahead of time who who feels, yeah, comfortable Uh holding you in that way. I think that's another really good one of like, it puts you in a vulnerable position, but also a very like supported and comforted position that Mm -hmm. can be one to play with as well. Yeah, that's fun. I like that. Number 23 is humming, singing, or oming. So this is actually something that um, there was a a 2018 systematic review of studies on breathwork. So, you know, any kind of like meditation or other practices involving controlling your breath. They found that humming in particular generates more nitric oxide, which sterilizes the air you breathe, increases your arterial oxygen, so the oxygen getting all the way out through your arteries, and would reduce blood pressure. So specifically Mm. humming has that effect. Also, it stimulates the vagus nerve, which helps to activate your parasympathetic nervous system. So your sympathetic nervous system is the one that amps up for danger and your parasympathetic is the one that brings it back down. So helps to activate that. Uh, And then it also improves your heart rate variability. So basically the, the ability to get your heart rate back down after it's been elevated, which is a measure of how well your body can move out of stress into a more relaxed state. And this is one that Dedeker and I have taken to doing with each other. When one person is stressing about something or freaking out, the other person will kind of come up and, and hold them and just go, mm. yeah, we <laughs> and we'll kind of hum at each other together. Just we're being goofy <laughs> and silly about it, but it, it does help. And there is actually some science to back up that that is a That's useful thing. Line. And you don't, And you don't need a partner to do that with you, right? This is something that you can do all on your own. I love oming and yoga. It's great. 
Yeah, Oming's great. I, I put this in there because years ago, my sister told me that like what her doctor had told her was that singing for at least 20 minutes produces basically the same effects in the body as like taking an opiate. Hell yeah. And now I couldn't find any specific <laughs> studies that was like, yes, one to one check. No right. So I, I couldn't fully fact check so that. Much. <laughs> there, you right. go. Well, I mean, there is something like singing and singing together with other yeah. people. Mm. Also, it, it, it does. There is some evidence to suggest that it helps increase our sense of well-being, probably because like humming or oming, there's that vibratory yeah. experience that vibrates against the vagus nerve and just helps us to feel more calm. Yeah. So you can you can hack that, baby. <laughs> or just speaking of other hacks for your body, put an ice pack on your neck. Yeah. Have you heard of this that one sounds before? Cold. I have not heard well, of it, it for is cold. stress reduction. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so so there was a pretty small study, um, 2018 study published in JMIR Formative Research. And by small, I mean, I think there was like 60-ish participants or something. But they found that cold stimulation, specifically to the lateral neck area, so, so like the sides of, the of oh. your neck, they found that that increased heart rate variability and also lowered blood pressure. And then in the study, it was only for 16 seconds. So it wow. wasn't like put an ice pack on your neck for 10 minutes. It was pretty short and there was, there was still pretty significant effects. There's a lot of theories about why this is, again, related to the vagus nerve or related to the diving reflex, but you don't have to understand all of that. <laughs> all you have to know is that this can be something that can potentially be a sort of a... A quick hack, I suppose, of helping to bring your body a little bit closer to a sense of goodness and well-being. An ice hack. Cool. An ice hack. <laughs> Number 25, <laughs> pet an animal. Yes. Oh, yeah. I, uh, I love this so much. It's, there's, there is little better when you're feeling off or bad or just overwhelmed than a cat or a dog or someone jumping into your lap, <laughs> some creature and loving on you and getting to pet that animal. It, it is kind of like taking your overwhelm and, and putting it outside of yourself a bit or caring or just making another being feel good. I think it, it in turn also makes you feel good. So there's a yeah. lot of studies on this and it's just great overall. Yeah. And then number 26, our last one for this category is to find a way to laugh. I was actually just reading an article a couple of days ago talking about the researchers who've been studying the science of laughter and why we do it as humans and what it's all about. And one of the things that that they have found and that's come up in a lot of the research is that laughter is a way that we indicate things are safe. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you think about that situation of we're startled by something or we're scared for a moment and then we realize what it is and that it's so, so something silly that happened and we, we laugh about it. And that laughter is not just for ourselves, but also to signal the other humans around us. Don't worry. Everything's OK. And now when is that do you think that's where nervous laughter comes from or awkward laughter? I think it must that it's be. like this impulse yeah. to be like, oh, I have to make this OK. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it must be related. But that is that is an interesting question. If we have any laughter researchers out there, hit us up. Uh, we'll do a whole episode <laughs> talking about that. But yeah, finding a way to laugh. Right. So if you've got particular movies or shows or podcasts or something that consistently make you laugh, I know it can be hard to feel like laughing when you're stressed out, but you may find once you start getting into that content, you might let yourself laugh anyway, and that that will then kind of create a feedback loop, getting you to feeling more safe and more okay. There's also laughter yoga. Have you heard of that? No, I have. I have. I've never done that? it or seen it, but I have heard of this. Oh yeah. It's a whole thing. We're kind of, I mean, my understanding of like the way that it works is that, you know, the, like, I don't know, it's this weird, funny thing where it's all about just like people laughing. Right. And so I think the way that it tends to start out is like, 
it starts out with a leader, obviously kind of like fake laughing, right? Mm -hmm. Just kind of like producing a laugh. And like, that's how you encourage people. Like you got to like produce the laugh first. And then I think that's like the absurdity Mm -hmm. of it kicks in. And then people start laughing at the absurdity and then laughing at the way that your laugh sounds. And then like, and then it's like, we're, then it's like the, the snowball has gathered enough momentum that then we're genuinely laughing and getting the benefits that come along with laughter. And that makes sense. If we're kind of signaling as a group, Hey, everything's safe now. That, that there could be a lot of benefit to doing that in a group as well. That's really interesting. Wow. Yeah. I'd like to go try that sometime and see how it is. Yeah. Okay, folks. So we are going to hit pause here for today in our second part of this episode. Next week is when we're going to be getting into tools for your relationships and tools for your heart mm. and soul yeah. as well. So We're going to be throwing up a question on our Instagram stories this week. We want to hear from you. When you feel jealous, do you feel it more in your brain or in your body? And I realize for a lot of folks, it's a little bit of both, but I'm willing to bet you probably skew one or the the other. So I'm really interested to hear what people have to say about that. In addition, the best place to share your thoughts with other listeners is the episode discussion channel in our Discord server, or you can also post about it in our private Facebook group. You can get access to these groups and join our exclusive community by going to patreon.com slash multiamory. In addition, you can share with us publicly on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Multiamory is created and produced by Jace Lindgren, Emily Matlack, and me, Dedeker Winston. Our episodes are edited by Mauricio Balvanetta. This episode was researched by M. Mays. Our production assistants are Rachel Shenowork and Carson Collins. Our theme song is Forms I Know I Did by Josh and Anand from the Fractal Cave EP. The full transcript is available on this episode's page on multiamory.com 